Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Monday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. The Ohio train derailment is reigniting fears here in New Jersey. Two weeks after a train carrying hazardous materials and toxic chemicals derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, residents there are reporting a growing number of health problems, from rashes and nausea to difficulty breathing. And they're becoming more convinced those symptoms are linked to the toxic vinyl chloride released when the freight train crashed. That's despite reports from federal environmental officials officials that no dangerous levels of the contaminants are being detected. But the federal government is sending medical experts to open a health clinic there tomorrow at noon. People in the area can get health screenings and, hopefully, medical questions answered. Advocates who lived through the Paulsboro, New Jersey train derailment of 2012 that spilled the same toxic chemicals say they know those fears well, and they're mounting new calls to action to prevent it from happening again. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Immediately, I was thinking, these poor people, because I know what's coming their way. As Pat Schubert watched first responders in Ohio struggling to respond after this month's train derailment containing tank cars of toxic vinyl chloride, it triggered his memories of Paulsboro. A decade ago, a Conrail train derailed on a swing bridge in the South Jersey town, plunging four tank cars of vinyl chloride into Mantua Creek. One tank car cracked, sending up a hazardous chemical vapor cloud that lingered over the neighborhood where Schubert lived. He recalls, I can still see the fog. This is like 930 in the morning, about two hours plus after the wreck. And I have friends that were out there on the first responder teams without the proper equipment they needed, trying to help do whatever they could. It was just a disaster. This high dose of vinyl chloride was released and the people, the first responders, didn't have the information they need to, to, to mount a proper response. Tracy Carluccio is with the Delaware Riverkeeper and her office was just 13 miles away from the Paulsboro wreck. She says a National Transportation Safety Board report stated, this accident at Paulsboro stands out, however, because of the poorly executed emergency response. It lists failures, including how the incident commander botched hazmat protocols and Conrail's initial refusal to provide crucial information about dangerous chemicals aboard the train. Air monitoring arrived late and showed levels a thousand times over safety limits. They did the best they could, but they were not properly prepared. And this is a problem that we have across our entire nation. We're not preparing our emergency responders. We're not giving the equipment that's needed. The NTSB recommended federal regulations to require train crews to immediately provide the emergency response information for all hazardous materials on the train to federal, state, or local emergency response officials and assist with development of emergency operations and response plans. But many reforms, including a safer rail braking system, got rescinded during the Trump administration. Since 2015, 110 derailments nationwide have resulted in the release of hazardous materials. It's really important that we have a contingency plan in effect. Assemblywoman Ellen Parks picked up the bill championed by retired Senator Loretta Weinberg. She demanded tougher railroad safety rules for oil trains traveling through densely populated New Jersey towns after the horrific derailment and explosion that killed 47 people in Quebec, Canada. The bill set safety standards for railroads. You know, who to reach out to, whether to evacuate. Um, we also need to know what was on the train um, that was hazardous. Right. And, you know, like it doesn't have to be a 10 car explosion. It could be just one car that leaked in hazardous material. In 2014, New Jersey's Department of Health surveyed folks in Paulsboro and found more than half experienced symptoms showing acute exposure to high levels of vinyl chloride. 
Dr. Julianne Baer says health impact depends on length and intensity of exposure. Vinyl chloride generally with prolonged exposure, the concern is always cancer, uh, liver cancer mainly, but also lung cancer brain, leukemia. But cancer can take years to show up. Attorney Mark Cooker sued Conrail on behalf of a couple thousand Paulsboro residents, almost all settled out of court. Some accepted Conrail checks for 500 bucks immediately after the wreck, but gave up their right to sue for more. Cooker says it's all about avoiding liability. People were not told the truth then. They weren't told the truth about how serious it was and how dangerous it was. The Ohio derailment remains under investigation, but Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg sent Norfolk Southern a stinging letter blaming the rail industry for lobbying against safety upgrades while pocketing billions in profits. He promised stiffer fines and regulations. The railroad says it's reviewing the letter. Meanwhile... This could happen in your town. It could happen in some far-off town in the middle of the country at any moment. Schubert settled with Conrail. He moved his family out of Paulsboro and away from rail lines. I'm Brenda Flanagan and J Spotlight News. President Biden making a surprise high-stakes visit to the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, early this morning, taking a nearly 10-hour train ride from the border of Poland to meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, underscoring his administration's unwavering support just days before the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion. Presidents Biden and Zelensky laid wreaths to honor fallen Ukrainian soldiers, Biden announcing another half a billion dollars in U.S military aid for the war-torn country and more sanctions to come against Moscow. Zelensky has repeatedly called on the West to provide fighter jets and other long-range weapons, which the U.S. has declined. It's unprecedented for an American president to travel to an active war zone without a large U.S. military presence, but the visit comes at a critical time for President Biden, who's trying to keep allies unified in support for Ukraine with the war or expected to intensify. Meanwhile, on this President's Day, there are a handful of Republican White House hopefuls making their intentions known for the 2024 election. But it remains to be seen if any notable New Jerseyans still plan to toss their hat in the ring. We're talking Governor Murphy, U.S. Senator Cory Booker, and, of course, former Governor Chris Christie, who made a go of it back in 2016. Any and all will have to contend with a lingering factor one-time President Donald Trump. Senior political correspondent David Cruz reports. President's Day sales aside, today is a day to, sure, honor Presidents Lincoln and Washington. But in Jersey, it's also a day to wonder aloud who of our leaders, present and past, might be considering their own run for the big job. Witness Governor Murphy's recent trips to the Ukraine and Germany. But so far, all signs seem to point to President Biden running for re-election, which means Murphy won't run. That leaves his predecessor, Chris Christie, as the Jersey boy most likely to. When we last asked, the former governor was still in the mulling phase. I don't feel like I'm in any rush to go and introduce myself or reintroduce myself to the American people. I think they know me pretty well. And so I don't feel like I'm in a rush. So sometime in 2023, probably you know, end of first quarter, beginning of second quarter, is somewhere around the time where I think you probably have to make a decision. So far, the field of announced candidates consists of former President Donald Trump and his former acolyte, South Carolina Governor and UN Ambassador Nikki Haley. But as Christie friend and Republican National Committee member Bill Palatucci notes, this is not a typical election cycle. Typically in this stage, February is a time where things really heat up. But this cycle, no, everybody's uh, waiting and watching. Trump could have major legal issues to deal with in New York, in Georgia, and with what still could come out of the special prosecutor's January 6th investigation. Also, there's the DeSantis factor, the popular Florida governor, undeclared for president so far, is showing that he's a close second behind Trump in polls where Christie 
doesn't even register with voters, like literally zero percent. What I do see in, in being um, close to the governor uh, as I am is he is uh, sought after and speaks around the country all the time in, in many ways that that um, people like yourself and the media don't see. He just spoke in front of a, a group of five or six hundred people down in Florida um, last week or two. He was uh, in Washington recently at the RGA's um, uh, working with and speaking with uh, current and former Republican governors. He spoke at the Republican Jewish Coalition, a uh, huge event out in Las Vegas. Not to mention his weekly appearances on This Week on ABC. But another Christie confidant says, while he believes Christie's got what it takes to be a great president, he's not sure the former governor has an open lane to ride to victory. With Trump, loyalty seems to be 100%. I mean, to me, it's, it's like, they follow Simon Says. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? But the Trumpers, they can't hear anything but Trump. So you know they're out, right? The anti-Trumpers remember that he stood next to Trump. They're going like this. Uh, he, he's anti-Trump. So uh, I just, knowing my party, I just don't see, uh, yeah, there's some policy-oriented people who know he'd be a pretty damn good president, but I don't know if there's enough of them. It's about me trying to find um, the right moment to go, okay, the tumblers have clicked into place. I can go or they haven't. And I can willingly say, nah, Chris, this is not right. And by Christie's own time clock, that moment is fast approaching. Although some still believe that his moment may have actually passed. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. Negotiations have stalled between Medieval Times and the union representing the cast at the Lyndhurst location. New Jersey members trying to unionize over the summer, following in the footsteps of other locations nationwide. But workers say the company won't negotiate in good faith. Now the case is being dragged to court as Medieval Times sues the union for trademark infringement. Ted Goldberg has the latest. There's potential to be trampled, there's potential to be stepped on, you're breaking a limb, if a, a horse you know, weighs so much to step on you, that's it. Ison Wood knows the risks of working at medieval times. On Sunday, he was lucky that an accident with his horse led to a sore shoulder and not much else. My horse unfortunately didn't have their reins on them, so as I'm getting out onto my horse, not realizing it, I ended up on the horse and ended up falling off of it as it got outside of the arena. Wood says accidents are less likely to happen if Medieval Times agrees to a contract with the union representing its employees. Workers say safety and staffing levels are top priorities in negotiations. We would have some where we have a threshold of nights on, nights off, and then not even just nights, but also our backstage, our squires, people who are just well prepared. It seems like we're being punished for unionizing here when all we want to do is have a safe work environment and get paid properly for what we do. Fellow Knight Jonathan Beckus says he's not sure Medieval Times is operating in good faith. Last October, the company sued the union in federal court for trademark infringement. The union's name is Medieval Times Performers United, and the company alleges since Medieval Times appears in the name of the union, it could create consumer confusion. They're claiming people will be confused that it'll be the company, and I can assure you that we don't look like the company. If that's the tactic you're going to use, what other horrible, evil, deplorable tactics are you going to use in the future? Monica Garza works as a queen. She says Medieval Times has regulated speech on social media, deleting any comments considered pro-union. They started hiding comments. They started deleting comments. They took down comments completely on their own TikTok because they know that they've lost in the, pub the court of public opinion. We reached out to Medieval Times for a response to these allegations and to discuss the lawsuit. We didn't hear back. I think the lawsuit is quite frivolous on the part of the corporation. William Brucher is a professor of labor studies and employment relations at Rutgers. He doesn't expect the lawsuit to do more than try and scare off workers. My understanding, it's like well within fair use because they are, of course, workers at medieval times and they're associated with medieval times. So um, I, it, to me, it's just uh, it's it's just an attempt at um, at punitive retaliation. Medieval Times United has filed multiple complaints with the National Labor Relations Board while trying to hammer out a contract. It's a lawyer and then two other people, and uh, 
they'll sit there and tell you why you're not worth it and uh, why they have the money to pay you but they don't value enough to do so. We're making these huge concessions, you know, coming down huge percents of what we originally wanted. Former employees claim they've been pushed out because they supported the union. Sean Quigley worked here for five years. He agreed to return after COVID for one performance and one rehearsal a week. And they'd scheduled me for two rehearsals instead of my regular one, and I missed the email where they put in that I was gonna be for two rehearsals. As a result, Quigley was written up. I'd missed several rehearsals over years, and so had other people, I'd never heard anything about it. It does explain on the piece of paper that by signing the write-up, you are giving them permission to effectively fire you. Soon after, Quigley was scheduled for a meeting, but not a performance. He quit before attending that meeting, assuming he would be fired. If an employee is put in a position whereby they choose to resign because their job has effectively been made unpleasant off the back of union organization activity, pro-union activity, and you can put a clear correlation between those two things, from a legal standpoint, that is the same as them firing you. The next step in the ongoing legal dispute between Medieval Times and its union comes on Tuesday when a judge is expected to rule on a motion brought on by the union to dismiss the trademark violation lawsuit. In Lyndhurst, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. In South Jersey, a new program is hoping to ensure someone's past doesn't predict their future. By investing millions of dollars into workforce training and other skills for individuals on probation, with an emphasis on those who've had prior drug offenses, helping them find jobs, purpose, and a fresh start. Raven Santana has the story. I could do things. You know, the problem wasn't me doing those things. It was actually getting a job. You know, because every time I, I go put in, you know, my record comes up and it was like, mm, we can't do nothing with you. 47 year old Eli Manuel Aviles Barreto isn't ashamed that he once was addicted to opioids after a bad motorcycle accident or even that he has drug offenses on his record. He says he's ashamed that he struggled to find a job because of his past and he's not alone. Aviles Barreto is one of the 130,000 New Jerseyans who are currently on probation, many for drug offenses. I don't have any criminal offense, I have any uh, violent offenses, you know, it's all uh, drug charges and, you know, low court offenses. Uh, I think that for me, you know, getting a job where I'm doing something that I think for me, you know, it matters and it's going to make a difference. It definitely, you know, makes me think about not wanting to go back, you know. Uh, Aviles Barreto has successfully completed the Judiciary Opportunities for Building Success, also known as the NJ Jobs Program. The initiative was established by retired Superior Court Judge Mark Sanson and Stockton President Harvey Kesselman, who was the chair of the New Jersey President's Council. It's no longer enough to, do, to make sure that someone does not get caught committing a crime uh, within the two, three, four or five years of probation. Now, the emphasis is on getting them a, a job, a good job at a living wage with benefits in order to successfully complete probation. The goal is to provide workforce development training and employment opportunities for individuals on parole through partnerships with higher education. A $3 million grant to support the program will also create spaces for things like internships, studies, and the opportunity for people like Avila's Barreto to attend college. There's, there's 130,000 people on probation in the state. So imagine the cost to do the training for that many people, all right? So that we want to ramp this program up to meet as many probationers as possible in the state. And that's what the funds are going to be earmarked for. They spend the first two or three weeks on what we call employment soft skills. What are employment soft skills? You have to wake up in the morning at, at six o'clock or six thirty in the morning. You have to you have to you have to get dressed appropriately. You have to show up at work on time. And the theory of our workforce development trainers is if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Uh, you have to be dressed appropriately. And then financial literacy. What do you do with your paycheck at the end of the week? If you have conflict on the job, how do you resolve conflict? You don't resolve conflict by walking out the door or by, you know, slugging somebody. Um, these are all skills that have to be taught to people who have never had a job. And uh, without, without that, sending somebody to a job is kind of a 
a, you were correct, Raven, a hopeless procedure because they're going to get to the job a week or two later. They're going to get in a fight with somebody and it's going to it's not going to work out well. And here we are back in the pickle barrel again. You've got the governor behind it, the Department of Labor is behind it. So all of these entities, private corporations are behind it. All of these entities together will get the word out. But if we show, wait, it's not that much of a risk. All three men say they now are on a mission to continue growing and expanding the program so that despite your past record, you can have the support and access you need to feel prepared and get a fair chance when applying for a position and turn ultimately making New Jersey a better place to live and work. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. Well, we now have a clearer picture of the millions of Americans who applied for President Biden's student loan forgiveness program. More than 1.1 million of them are from New Jersey. That's according to a report by Politico. The highest percent per capita came from majority non-white and lower income neighborhoods. Hudson and Gloucester counties had towns with the largest number of applicants. New Jersey residents owe more than $43 billion in federal student loans. It's the 12th highest highest loan burden in the country, according to federal data. But it's unclear whether any of those borrowers will ever have their debt wiped clean. The program remains in limbo. It's tied up in legal challenges in the U.S. Supreme Court four months after being launched. Oral arguments are slated for later this month with a decision expected by as late as June. In our business report tonight, help for the little guys. The state has a new program to support startups. Rhonda Schaffler has the details, plus our other top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, starting a business requires hard work, perseverance, and money. To help support new businesses in New Jersey, the Commission on Science, Innovation, and Technology recently awarded a total of more than $500,000 to 17 startups in the latest funding round of a small business assistance program. The startups are focused on a range of industries from clean technology to aerospace and gene therapy. The commission has awarded nearly two and a half million dollars to 80 startups since 2020. With today being a holiday, a lot of New Jersey workers are enjoying a four day work week. In Prospect Park, most municipal workers have had a four day, 40 hour work week all this month. It's part of a pilot program that Prospect Park's mayor says provides a better work life balance. Police officers and public works employees are not participating in the pilot, which runs through June 30th. The latest jobs report shows plenty of companies are still hiring, but job candidates are getting frustrated by having to go through several rounds of interviews. And a conference board survey finds 18% of those candidates take action if they don't hear back from a company. Rebecca Ray is executive vice president of Human Capital at the conference board. Generationally, you have a group of people now who are more likely to post a negative review or to refrain from recommending or to write off a company and perhaps its products or services when they're not or they perceive that they are not treated fairly in an interview. Finally, state lawmakers are trying to encourage more people to save for retirement by making contributions to certain plans exempt from state income tax. Right now, only 401k contributions are tax exempt, but this bill would expand the tax exemption to other plans like 403b retirement plans and IRAs. Several business groups are backing the legislation. Find out more by reading my colleague John Reitmeyer's article on njspotlightnews.org. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, announcing its renewed Jersey Business Summit and Expo, March 14th and 15th at Harrah's in Atlantic City. Event details online at njchamber.com. Finally, on this President's Day, some news to share about former President Jimmy Carter. After a series of brief hospital stays, the 98-year-old longest living American president is entering hospice care. It's at his home in Plains, Georgia, according to a statement from the Carter Center. 
The statement goes on to say the 39th president has the full support of his family and medical team in opting to, quote, spend his remaining time at home instead of additional medical intervention. Carter beat brain cancer in 2015 but faced a number of other health scares in the years since. The one-time peanut farmer and little-known Georgia governor rose to prominence as a Washington outsider when he launched his bid for the presidency ahead of the 1976 election, defeating then-President Gerald R. Ford, serving a single tumultuous term from 1977 to 1981. Carter went on to earn a Nobel Peace Prize in 2002 for his work with the nonprofit center he founded with wife Rosalind, who remains at his side. And that does it for us this evening. But make sure you head over to njspotlightnews.org and follow us on our social media platforms to keep up with all the latest news on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. NJM Insurance Group has been serving New Jersey businesses for over a century. As part of the Garden State, we help companies keep their vehicles on the road, employees on the job, and projects on track. Working to protect employees from illness and injury, to keep goods and services moving across the state. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. If you need to see a doctor, RWJ Barnabas Health has two easy ways to do it from anywhere. You can see an urgent care provider 24-7 on any device with our Telemed app. Or use our website to book a virtual visit with an RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group provider or specialist, even as a new patient. You've taken every precaution, and so have we. So don't delay your care any longer. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.